How's that? Can you hear me? Can I ask for everybody on the end who has a seat next to them to just move a little bit in so that latecomers have a place to sit? <laughs> just move in one seat. Um, as a latecomer often myself, it's a huge <laughs> gift if you walk in and there's a place to sit. <laughs> But not, not too much, because, because I think they've shut the, the side doors, too, so. You're good, you're good. OK. Um, I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, my talk is entitled, Freedom in My Heart and Everywhere. Um, as Josh said, um, I've been involved in the free and open source software community for a while. I am the executive director of the GNOME Foundation, and we'll get to some of that a little bit later, which is really cool. Um, and I, for a long time, was a lawyer at the Software Freedom Law Center, um, resulting in eventually becoming general counsel. And so I had this really lucky opportunity to get to know a lot of folks in the free and open source software community by helping them with all of the crap that they didn't want to deal with. Really, really fun. Um, I've been a free and open source software enthusiast, I'd say, since the 90s. And um, I'm also a patient. I have a really, really big heart. I actually have a huge heart. <laughs> so you'd think because I work for a nonprofit, but I actually have an enlarged heart. So um, I have a condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I always get a little bit nervous when I talk about that because I sort of say, you know, my, my heart's a little broken. But um, it means that uh, I have, um, it's, it's not actually. <laughs> uh, my heart, my heart is, is, is very thick. And that means that it has a hard time beating. It's a little bit stiff. And it's actually pretty fine. I don't have any symptoms yet. Um, I just have a very high risk of suddenly dying. The term is actually sudden death. That's what the doctors tell you when they say you have HCM and um, you, know, you, you need to enter into this lifelong treatment. Um, they say you have a high risk of sudden death which is really terrifying as a patient. Um, I have about a two to three chance per year of suddenly dying, and that compounds. So um, I found out about this at age 31, and um, so over the next decade, it was sort of like a 20 to 30% risk of sudden death. Um, really, really just um, a really scary thing to hear, um, but there is a solution right now, which is to get a defibrillator. And what a defibrillator does is it sits into your, into your, in your body. I, I actually, I did get one, and it's, it's right here. It looks really huge there, but it's about like this big, and it sits right here. Um, and it has wires that um, snake through my blood vessels and screw into my heart. And um, it basically constantly monitors me, and it's like having people following me around with paddles. And uh, if I go into sudden death, it will shock me, and, um, and I'll be great. Um, and, and I won't die. It's very exciting. <laughs> so um, so um, all that is, is pretty well and good. The, um, the electrophysiologist that I saw when, uh, when I told this has a bunch of these in his desk drawer, just you know, sort of so that he can pass it over to patients. Because I think when you see how little this device is, you know, it doesn't feel so scary. You know, he, so he pushed it over the desk at me. I'm sitting there with my mother, and I pick it up. He's like, pick it up. See how light it is. So I pick it up, and I say, cool. What does it run? <laughs> To which I got a blank look. My mother gave me a blank look. And sort of said, what, what are you talking about? And I said, well, I just, you know, obviously this piece of equipment is only as good as its software. I mean, it, it, it relies on its software to know when it is that I've gone into sudden death, whether it's, you know, I've run across the street when I shouldn't have, or I decided to run a marathon, or, um, or for no reason at all. Um, it, you know, I'm, I'm totally relying on this software to know when is the appropriate time to give me a shock and when it's not, um, when, I, when I need pacing, maybe, or, or when I don't. And um, the electrophysiologist, of course, had no answer at all. He said, nobody's ever asked me this. I've never thought about the software on this device. Hang on, there is a representative from Medtronic here in our office today. I will get him because he's the manufacturer and surely they have thought about this. <laughs> so in walks this representative 
And I sort of explain, you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer at the Software Freedom Law Center. I care about the software on my device. I just want to know, you know, how does it work? What does it run? Can you tell me? And he said, nobody's ever asked me that before. <laughs> so we had this, this really interesting conversation. And he said, I see that this is a very serious issue. Here's my number. Um, you know, call me, and I'll put you through to people to talk about this. So um, emboldened by this, I went and I called, I called him at Medtronic, and he gave me the tech, the tech line. And so I called, I kept leaving messages. Um, eventually, I, I, I kept being bounced around, and nobody would, um, would talk to me about this. Um, I called the other two major medical device manufacturers, um, Boston Scientific and St. Jude, and neither of them could give me real answers either. Um, eventually, I started calling and saying, look, if someone would let me look at the software, I'll sign an NDA, you know? Really against my principles, because I don't, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm a nonprofit activist in the technology world. I don't want to sign any, you know, any NDAs that will prevent me from sharing what I find with somebody else. But I thought, at least I'll be able to see the source code, and I'll feel comfortable about what's being put in my body. But unfortunately, um, I, was, I was brushed off. I was told no. Um, I got some, talked to some people at Medtronic that were sympathetic. They made sure I, I had access to, to, to good doctors. People said, oh, you know, I, you know we're, we're Medtronic. We care deeply about making sure that there are no bugs in the software that we put on these devices. <laughs> Obviously, we wouldn't release it if we didn't think it was safe. You know, all these things, you must trust us. Um, doctors say, you know, well, actually, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA in the United States, approves these devices. So, you know, clearly you're overreacting. And when I was talking to that same electrophysiologist on the phone and said, I'm really troubled by this because, you know, I, I think about all the people that have these devices. Some of them are quite powerful. Um, Dick Cheney had one at the time. Um, he has a, a more impressive um, device now that actually continually circulates his blood so, um, so he has no pulse. It's a <laughs> fascinating, fascinating device. Yeah. Um, so, um, so, you know, there are a lot of prominent people. The, the demographic that, that gets these devices are, you know, are, are, are often in, in some powerful positions. And so you could easily imagine a situation where someone would be wanting to shut down these devices. And the electrophysiologist that I spoke to on the phone got so upset. He got so upset that he hung up on me. He said, I don't, I, I think you're up to something. I don't understand. I don't know why you're so upset about this. If you want to get a device, I'll help you. But I, I think, I, I just, I just don't, I just think you're, 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 hang up. And, and, you know, I think it was very scary because he told me at the beginning of talking to him that he installs these devices all the time. He installs devices, sometimes several devices a day. So, you know, the idea that he could be not even asking questions about the software that runs on these devices was, was pretty terrifying to him. So I put the whole thing off. And I just said, you know, I, I, I can't think about this. It's so terrifying. I'm not really, am I really going to get proprietary software in my body? I don't know. Plus the whole, <laughs> plus the whole you know, mortality thing is, is, is and, and, and getting a piece of equipment um, sewn into your, your, your body is, it's just, you know, it was, it was really a lot to deal with. So I, I kept putting it off. And eventually I couldn't anymore because friends and family just kept, um, kept asking me about it and asking me about it and saying, you know, we're so worried about you. We know that you can die at any time. My mother, you know, I, I, I of course don't have a landline and I don't have great uh, mobile reception in my apartment. And my mother, if I didn't call her back within an hour, would start calling all my friends saying, have you spoke to Karen today? Do you know if she's okay? Um, I went to brunch with a friend and she asked me, how this process was going, and I said, well, nobody from the medical companies is calling me back, and you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll work it out. And she just burst into tears, and she said, you know, you, you, could, you could die today. And I, I, I just can't deal with that. If you don't take care of this, I don't know if I can be friends with you, because you know, this is a serious thing, and you're ignoring it for what she considered to be an esoteric issue. So I really understood that, and I really didn't have a choice. So I got a device. Um, I got it implanted, and it, it, it took some time to... Um, <laughs> it took some time, you know, I mean, just to recover from the surgery and also to, um, you know, just to, to really think about 
uh, my own situation in a more abstract way to do some research, but I swore that if I got the device that I would, I would do some research and I would write a paper and I would you know, sort of talk about the issues that came up that the medical profession, or at least the medical professionals that I dealt with were, um, you know, had no answers for. So the things that I found out when I wrote my paper were um, things that would surprise you and things that would not surprise you. So software has bugs. I really, really, really wanted to get a picture of the crickets that were in my room last night, <laughs> that uh, fellow They're keynoters. Cockroaches. They are cockroaches? Yes. <laughs> These are cockroaches. <laughs> Uh, but but <laughs> Paul, and, Paul and Jake got them out of my room, so <laughs> that was very exciting. Um, so we were joking that I was going to talk about real bugs instead of software bugs. But, um, <laughs> but, um, but so software has bugs, and, um, and uh, medical devices, as, like as Mar Matthew Garrett said, UEFI, um, will have bugs because the Software Engineering Institute estimates that there's about one defect per every 100 lines of code. So even if um, a majority of the bugs are caught in testing, um, even if three quarters of the bugs are caught in testing, that's still a lot of, a lot of bugs. Um, there's a, um, a study that I read that looked at, um, at recalls of devices that were published by the FDA. Um, so basically, um, this study looked at all of the recalls and determined which ones that they could tell were from software failures, and then they evaluated those. And the ones that they could tell um, they could tell enough about what the problem was from the software, 98% of them would have been detected with simple all pairs testing. So, I mean, basic, basic testing that you would expect for, for, for any, you know, any kind of technical piece of equipment. So, yes, the FDA has some review over these devices, but, you know, if, if the companies aren't doing basic testing, what, what, are, what, are, we, what are we doing? So, software has bugs. We, we, we know this here in this room. Another thing that most of us here know is that um, security through obscurity doesn't work. And this is something that seems really counterintuitive for the folks that are not in this room. Um, every, every person who I started talking to about this in the medical profession said, but I don't understand. Why would you want people to be able to see the software? If people can see the source code, it will be that much easier for them to break into it. But as we all know, that's not quite true. And in fact, um, by publishing the source code, everybody can see it and it'll be a lot safer. Um, but this is a, a major point that actually I address in, in my paper, Killed by Code, which uh, you know, goes systematically through a lot of the research that shows how security professionals um, agree with that assertion. Um, so what we have is actually the worst of both worlds. We have closed code. So, um, so it doesn't have the safety of having a lot of people reviewing it. Um, but we also have no security on these devices. So a lot of these devices are broadcasting wirelessly. Um, that's the standard right now. Um, when I found out about that, I was totally freaked out. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean my, my, you know, my heart device is going to be continuously broadcasting? Like that, that just, you know, I mean, thinking about the conferences that I go to, the people I hang out with, I don't, I don't want, I don't want my, my information being broadcasted. Um, so I, 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 this is one of the things I brought up with the different doctors that I spoke to. Um, I, I actually, as you might imagine, I got rid of that electrophysiologist that hung up on me. Um, and I went from cardiologist to cardiologist to find someone who really, um, understood these problems, or at least understood why I was so worried about them. Um, and I finally found a great cardiologist and a great electrophysiologist um, who said, ah, I have never thought about this issue, but I understand why it could be a problem. You need this device. You can't wait another day, but I'm going to work with you and see ways that we can at least address some of the things that you're worried about. So one of the things that, um, that my electrophysiologist did was that he called around from hospital to hospital until he found an old device. So he sort of said, OK, I've got, you know, I've got a really simple heart condition. All that I need to do is to have a device that's going to be monitoring um, for a dangerous rhythm. And if I get a dangerous rhythm, 
it will shock me. It's a much more simple um, algorithm than what the newer devices do. So a lot of the newer devices have these complex pacing algorithms for people who have a wide variety of problems. You know, you don't understand why the medical device companies do this. They do it because um, you know, single devices, you know, these devices are very difficult to make. They're precision manufacturers. Um, and if they can get these devices that work for a broader range of cases, then that's all, all the better. And then you never know what kind of um, additional complications that people are going to be developing. So you know, I don't have any symptoms now but I might develop them, and it's great to have the pacing technology. But my electrophysiologist, my cardiologist said, great, you know, I know that you have a very simple, um, simple need here, so why don't I find you an old device? So I actually have an older device that communicates using magnetic coupling, um, and, and not through wireless technology, but my father has a wireless um, enabled pacemaker, and when he walks into a room and the technician's office, they just change his pulse. So, you know, he, before he even sits down, they know so much about him and they have the ability to, to really affect him. It's, it's incredible. But, um, but as you can see at the last point on this slide, these devices have been hacked. Um, a um, university think tank, uh, actually a uh, think tank of a couple of universities worked together and, um, and showed that using just commercially available equipment, you could hack into these devices and take control of them. They were able to not only deliver shocks, which is, is terrifying. I once had my device shock me in error, and um, I can tell you it's like being kicked in the chest. Um, you are basically, you're, you know, you're out of commission at least for a few minutes. I had to sit down, and I, it was so exhausting, just the surprise of it and, um, and the worry that I, I went to sleep for a few hours afterwards. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty unnerving. And, um, so not, not only that, they were able to deliver those shocks, but they were also able to um, stop um, the delivery of treatment. So if the device was pacing, they could stop the pacing, and a lot of people require their pacing in order to just live. So, so a lot of people can't walk up a flight of stairs. My father's one of these if his pacing is, is disrupted. Um, they were also able to get key information off of these devices, like uh, medical ID numbers, um, doctor's names, um, serial numbers, a lot of personal information that's, that's broadcasting, and there's no encryption of any kind um, on these devices. So it's, it's, it's pretty scary. They were also able to put these devices into test mode, and what that does is it slowly runs down the battery, or runs down the battery at a much faster rate than, um, than under normal circumstances, and these devices are only as good as their batteries. So if my battery runs out in my device, I need a new device, which is surgery. So. These devices have been hacked. It was after I, I started, after I was diagnosed that that happened. But, um, but then I called up the doctors and said, see? <laughs> <laughs> so the doctors really rely on the fact that these devices are approved by the FDA um, in the United States and similar regulatory bodies elsewhere. And um, so as a good lawyer, I went and researched the FDA mechanisms for approval of software. And what I found? is that the FDA doesn't even typically review the source code on these devices. They don't, unless there's something obviously wrong with the software, they generally don't even ask to see it. Um, they, um, there isn't actually a clear set of requirements for the software even. And the reason why, I mean, there, there are reasons for, for, for all these decisions at the FDA, um, but we think, we're do, we think the FDA is doing a lot more than, than it turns out that they are. The fact that they don't have a clear set of requirements is connected to the fact that um, they, they say that the companies that design these devices, because they're so specialty and because they're so particular to each manufacturer, you know, there are probably tests that are specific to those devices and that the people who know those devices best are the manufacturers. And therefore, they're the ones that need to design what the tests are. And there's some back and forth about whether they've done the right tests or not, but the truth of the matter is at the end of the day, there's nobody at the FDA that even sees the source code. Because they're not requesting the source code, they don't even have a repository of it. So if there's catastrophic failure at Medtronic, for example, I don't know that there's a canonical repository for the software that I would have access to. And without being able to update the software on my device, I may have to get surgery to get a new one. So, you know, if there's a problem, you know, my doctor, or, or some, really, truthfully, or some savvy, <laughs> some, some programming savvy doctor um, that I could, I could find would be able to help, or work with, work with um, to, um, to write a patch for my, for my device, should there be a bug, or should we find it out? So 
Um, I actually spoke on a panel with um, a guy in cybersecurity at the FDA, and I was really, really nervous because, you know, I, I did as much, I'm a lawyer, I did all the research I could about the FDA, but I, I was sort of not sure if this was actually the case in practice, so I put up the slide and I said, you know, John, tell me if I'm wrong, but this is what I think it is, and uh, this is the way I think it is, and I followed it with a slide about free and open source software and why it's so much better and so much safer, and, um, and as soon as he came up to speak, he said, everybody thinks that the FDA should do this and the FDA should do that, but we just don't have the resources. And you know, that is not what the FDA is set up to do. And then he paused and he looked at me just as I was about to sort of you know, say, and he said, and he said, but you're saying something different. You're saying we let everybody else review the source code. That is very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Making sure that our devices are, um, you know, are, have software published means that everybody else can review it. I mean, I would have reviewed it. My, my dad, who has that pacemaker, is also an engineer um, and a Fortran programmer. He probably would have looked over it. Um, many of us know people with pacemakers. We would scour that code, for sure. Um, and uh, one other thing that I found out, which was a little bit weird, is that because these devices in the United States are approved by a federal agency, patients are preempted from suing under state tort law. So there's a whole avenue of remedy that patients normally get, which the medical device manufacturers don't even have to worry about. So now, I mean, I'm not saying that the medical device companies don't care if their patients die, obviously they do, but there's a whole part of, of legal remedies that, that aren't even available. Um, so uh, really amazing, this research, and a lot of, all of it is set out in this, this paper I wrote that's available on the Software Freedom Law Center's website. Um, so all this results in the fact that I don't have freedom in my own body. I, I'm not allowed to review the software that is implanted in it. It's literally connected and screwed into my heart, and I can't take a look at it. It's, it's unbelievable to me, and I, I, I still, my mind is blown at the fact that this situation happened to me. I mean, it's a little bit freakish that I was a lawyer at the Software Freedom Law Center, and I happen to have this rare heart condition, I admit. But, um, but still, just mind-blowing. I didn't even have a choice. The choice was either you are extremely likely to die or you can get this device in your body. Um, I, I hope that nobody in this room has to face that choice, but it, it was really, really, really scary. Um, and then I started thinking about it. And you know, it's not just our heart devices. It's anything that our lives and our society rely on. And as I thought about it, I realized that this actually touches on a lot, a lot more areas of our lives than I thought it was. For example, cars. Yeah, so like the university think tank that, um, that worked on those, um, those medical devices, and I would say if you have time and are bored, you should totally read that study. It's fascinating. They implanted the device into a, a bag of bacon or meat of some kind to simulate it, and they, they show all the equipment that you can, you can find anywhere um, that, that they used to, to hack into it. But, um, but the same process was done with cars, and a different think tank showed that um, they were able to hack into two different brands, uh, two different manufacturers' cars. Um, so the IEEE says that a premium class car has close to 100 million lines of code. So if we think back to what the Software Engineering Institute said about um, one bug for every 100 lines of code, that's a lot of bugs. A lot of bugs just in your car. Um, and, um, and what this think tank was able to do was, um, was all the things that you might expect they were able to cause the car to accelerate and to brake. They were able to control each wheel of the car individually. And my favorite part, just for, for kicks, is that, um, I don't know if you can see, but they were able to put a, a, a message on the dash. And so they said, pwned. And there's the little, the little uh, X-eyed emoticon. Um, there. So, you know, the idea that they were able to take control over two different brands of premium class cars was, um, you know, is, is, is really amazing to me. Um, voting machines is another area that is 
super critical in that we've actually been talking about, a lot of security experts have been talking about, um, about the problems with our voting machines. In the United States, we rely on, um, on Diebold and a lot of um, uh, private manufacturers. Um, and um, you know, we have had problems with calibration. I don't know if you've seen, but uh, there are all these hilarious cartoons of people trying to vote for the right candidate and uh, the name of the candidate they want to vote for moving around the screen and sort of, you know, you're trying to poke after it and eventually, no matter what you do, it says, so you wanted to vote for your, you know, you wanted to vote for the opposite candidate, right? 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 Um, and it's very difficult to know. And because we don't, off, we, we sometimes don't have verification, a, a paper receipt, we don't even know necessarily that our vote was counted properly and that um, we were able to vote for the right candidate in the end. Um, Really weird, as this is the you know the basis of our society um, and the backbone of our democracy. Uh, I love what they did in Brazil. Um, I don't know if you guys heard about this, but Brazil said, you know, we know that so software has vulnerabilities and software has bugs. So what we're going to do is we're going to invite uh, teams of hackers to come in. We're going to give you the source code. And we're going to give a prize to anybody who finds a way to, uh, finds a vulnerability to, to, to game the system. And um, of those uh, teams, two of them were able to find bugs. They say that, um, that neither of them would have affected um, an election, but, um, but they were able to fix those bugs. And those hackers got a prize. Democracy is safer. Security through obscurity doesn't work. I don't know when we're going to figure when we're going to figure this out, but Brazil has got it down, so um, it's possible. Our financial institutions, yeah, it's exciting. Um, financial institutions are another area we've seen recently. You know how bad it can be when our um, our trusted institutions fail, and a lot of these institutions are are running software and our you know our stock markets and just the operations of our bank. Um, these are all things that are. Um, are critical to, uh, to just the way we live our lives. It's, um, it's more of a societal thing, but, um, but it's, it, you know, we've already seen that there are vulnerabilities there. So all this to say, it sounds heavy-handed, but my medical device can be controlled. Our cars can be controlled and interfered with, and our financial institutions can be compromised. So I think we can all agree here that our society and life critical software must be safe. But we're in a really interesting time right now because how do we know what software that we use is life and society critical? The way that we use computers has totally changed very, very rapidly and very recently. Um, you know, I've been astounded how people of all ages have started using computers in a way that they, they never have before. Um, it's no longer specific tech savvy people that are computing, it's everybody, it's our grandparents, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's everyone. And we're using our software for everything. Um, it's, it's become, you know, how we, how we do everything. How we communicate with each other, you know, how we, you know, how we talk on the phone, how we, we write, how we create art, um, how, how we handle our educational institutions, and how we manage our lives. We're, we're, we're building all this infrastructure, and we're not really even, we're not even really thinking about it. Um, you know, a lot of people are using their phones to monitor things like their, um, their exercise schedules and their diet. Their, you know, it's very convenient because you're, you know, you're, you're keeping track of what you eat and as you go, or, um, or what, you, what you do. Some phones have, like, um, pedometer um, functionality built in. And, and that's, that's kind of basic and fundamental, but there's already software for the iPhone that can talk to an implanted insulin pump and compare your exercise and your diet um, information with your blood sugar levels on your insulin pump. So now suddenly we're back to where I was with my medical device. You've got an iPhone that you're relying on for your life. So, you know, we're, we're building all this infrastructure and we really need to think about it, which is why the desktop is so important. And this is where sort of this all fits into um, my personal story and why I left the Software Freedom Law Center, which I loved and felt like the luckiest lawyer in the world for being able to work there, um, and went to the GNOME Foundation, which, um, which I also love. But, um, and I say the desktop in quotes because I am talking about these ways that we interact with our computing and the ways that we manage our lives through software. Um, 
we've reached the point where software must be usable by everyone. Um, I think uh, everybody here probably knows an older person who, as of a few years ago, probably never did anything with their computer. Um, my mother was one of these people. She, um, you know, I remember when I was a kid, I kept saying, but mom, look at these cool games. Not interested. And then I remember I was in college and I said, mom, if we could talk by email, it would be so much better. Nothing. I remember in law school, I was saying, mom, I can do all this great research using my computer. I don't have to sit all day in the library. It's awesome. Nothing. Later, I try to say, mom, I'm organizing my travel using the computer. Suddenly, she was slightly interested. Um, and now, through everything that, that has come to pass, she can't do anything without her computer now. Now her computer has become, an, she, it's her first, her first thing when she does, she, she emails and talks to her friends, she, um, she does her travel, she, does, um, she manages her finances. It's, it's spectacular to me because, um, you know, and I don't use my father because he was an engineer, um, but my mother was really a bit of a technophobe, and now she loves Apple loves Apple. She can use her computer to do, you know, she doesn't have to think about it. It's great, um, you know, and, and it's very frustrating for me. <laughs> but I'm excited for her because she now can use a computer and it's something she owns now. She doesn't ask me questions, well, she does ask me questions, but she doesn't, she doesn't think that there's any reason why they, these devices are not targeted at her. And she is, very much a representative of the majority of our society. And these are people who only a few years ago would not have been that able to do very much with their computer. So we need to appeal to these people because they are the ones who are making choices like supporting iPhones to put in their exercise and diet regimes to talk to their insulin pumps. These are the, the, the kinds of things that we, we, we need to really worry about because um, because if we can't make our software easy to use by everybody, no one's going to want to use it. And we have an opportunity now, a window that is slowly closing, because we're making choices now that we're going to have to live with a long time. We're building habits. We're building expectations. And um, we're establishing the metrics in our society for what is acceptable software and what isn't. So. I'm not going to read these to you. You guys are here at um, Linux Cafe. You, you know all the awesome reasons why you should use free and open source software. You're here for all those reasons, including that it's just really fun. And we've been having a great time here and learning about all sorts of really cool things. But the underscore of all of that and where all of these reasons come from is from freedom. And free and open source software is not just good business. It's also the right thing to do. So when we talk about our heart devices, we talk about our voting machines, and then we talk about the way our, we live our lives and the infrastructure of how we talk to one another, we see that um, free and open source software is just the right thing to do for our society. And in order to bring that to other people, we need to make sure that it's easy and clear for them to use. So these are some screenshots from the GNOME 3 release, which most of you, I would say, are probably familiar with already and are forming your own opinions about whether you, <laughs> whether, whether GNOME 3 is something that you, you want to use or not. And I think that no matter um, what perspective you come from, I think you can see that the GNOME 3 rewrite is done to, to address these issues. It's to make our software sleek and usable by everybody. Um, I joined GNOME after the GNOME 3 release, and it was the GNOME 3 release that made me realize that I had to go work for GNOME because this, this is our future. We need to have, we need to cross the bridge. We need to be able to provide software to people who, who otherwise, you know, wouldn't be able to use it. We need to make sure our, our desktops are accessible by everyone because we are not going to be able to build the right infrastructure for our whole society if we don't bring these people on board too. Um, so uh, this is a second screenshot. Uh, that happens to be uh, Marina from the GNOME community, and that, um, and that, and she's the head of the uh, uh, GNOME uh, outreach program for women, which uh, is an awesome, awesome program, and uh, is the kind of thing you can do in a nonprofit. But um, what you may not have seen is that there's a we launched very recently an extensions website at extensions.gnome.org, where uh, third parties can upload. Um, extensions for the GNOME shell, and it's a simple point and click for uh, GNOME 3.2. 
So you can install all of this customization. And you know, we're sort of trying to, to build the ways that GNOME 3 is going, to, is going to develop over time. And so even though we have, um, we've, we have you know, a single GNOME shell vision with, um, with what I think are, are great choices, if you disagree with them, there's a way to, to implement um, changes. So GNOME, I think, and I think many agree, I've actually had a lot of people uh, look at my, com my computer over my shoulder and say, oh my god, what is that? That's so great. It's not a Mac, but it looks so good. What's the story with that? Um, so it's, it's beautiful, but it's, it's a lot more than beautiful. It's nonprofit driven. And um, in the free and open source software space, we have a lot of different ways that we develop our software together. Um, some of our, our projects are, you know, more on the, the Android um, or Unity uh, side of things where they're mostly controlled by a single company um, and there are communities that build up around that. But at the end of the day, the ultimate control of the project is by a single company. Um, and then we have projects like GNOME that are nonprofit focused. And this actually touches on some of the stuff that Bruce was mentioning in his keynote. Um, what you get for nonprofit development, or, or having a nonprofit that unifies the development in a community, is, um, is, is a lot. And one of the main, main things that you get is a key path of trust. So the GNOME community, for example, um, is, is the foundation is composed of members. I think there, there are over 300 members. It, it varies depending on um, where people are and renewing their membership. But in order to become a member, you have to become a contributor to GNOME. And it's only available to individuals. And if you're a contributor to GNOME, you can become a member, which allows you to vote for the board of directors, which um, influences the direction of the project, helps provide the infrastructure to support development, and, um, and decides to hire people like me, so who are out there advocating for the ideology of free and open source software and helping to organize um, this kind of, um, of effort. So if you imagine a situation now, the GNOME community does not require copyright assignment, but if a nonprofit community like the GNOME community were to require copyright assignment, were to accept copyright assignment, those copyrights would be held by a foundation that had um, oversight by the contributors, by everyone who has a stake in the community, by everybody who invests in it. There is a certain assurance to knowing that the control of a community is in a nonprofit that is focused on, um, on what the contributors want diversely over companies. Um, I did put in saying that it's, you know, I, I wanted to stress that I'm not saying that companies shouldn't, you know, don't have a, a very, very important place in free and open source software. Of course, um, companies, um, you know, must be able to, to develop products in the free and open source software community. But we need to encourage these nonprofit structures which are focused on the ideology and work with companies to help them accomplish their goals, um, but under the rubric of, 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 of nonprofits the way that we have in the GNOME community. We have a lot of companies that are involved in GNOME um, in the advisory board and just as good participants. Um, but the overall mission of the GNOME Foundation and the community is, is the public good. We are a public charity. So we are focused on the public good, not on our profit. Which means, I mean, we care about our profit but, um, for, the, for participants in our community, but what it means at the end of the day is that we're, we want to make the world a better place. It sounds a, little bit, it sounds a little bit hokey, but let's be honest, that's where a lot of this free and open source software came from originally, ideologically. That's why we have such great and cool software. We have to start thinking about making the world a better place. So we at GNOME recently launched an accessibility campaign. We want to make 2012 the year of accessibility. This is a perfect example. Yeah, it's really cool work. It's super important. So this is exactly the kind of thing that a company might not be able to afford to do. Um, because it's not necessarily in the in, you know, in, in, in interest in increasing the bottom line to, to work on specific accessibility initiatives for smaller populations of people. But we at GNOME understand that this is incredibly important because a desktop that's not usable by everybody is, 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 is one that fails our mission. So uh, this guy is Robert Cole. He is super awesome. That's a picture of him and his family. He, um, he was kind enough to come forward and let us use a testimonial of his um, for our accessibility campaign. 
he was born with a, a vision defect. So he has no vision in one eye and very limited vision in the other eye. Uh, he um, was relying on some proprietary um, assistive technologies um, at one point that were really working for him. He got a grant from his local government in order to get those, um, those technologies and they were assisting him to work. But then when his system upgraded, he applied for more funding to get the upgraded assistive technologies and he was denied additional funding. And he was just out of luck. Fortunately, GNOME has been a very accessible desktop and he was able to use GNOME technologies and, and through that he became a very um, uh, active member of the GNOME community. But with free and open source software technology, whatever we develop is going to be out there, it's going to be available. You don't have to rely on expensive proprietary upgrades to know that you're gonna continue to be able to use your software should your overall system upgrade. So, you know, making sure that this kind of work is done in a free and open source software um, environment is extremely important. So we've just launched this accessibility campaign. If you donate to GNOME um, while this campaign is going on, we pledge to use the money to um, develop assistive technologies. So all this to say, let's choose freedom. We can choose freedom. We in this room are a very special group of people. While I'm focusing on, you know, what our users are doing and how we must bring our users, you know, and I say the broader users, we have to think big, we have to think giant. And you know, while we need to do things that bring our, our, us our, our, our user base in, um, people in this room are making choices every day. I can't tell you how many iPhones I have seen at this conference, how many Macs I have seen in this conference. You know, we have the technology, it's good. I, 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 I don't really tweak my desktop very much anymore at all. I switched over to GNOME Shell and it's so sleek and great that I, I barely use the command line for things that are connected to, um, to my computing environment. Um, and, only, and only then when I, when I really, really feel like it. It's not for everybody, but we need to choose free and open platforms. We need to develop on them because it's the only way we're gonna create these you know, safer and better societies. We're, it's the only way we're going to create a world where we know that our software can be reviewed and that it will have integrity. We need to build with, we need to build our communities in the nonprofit space because we need to create those really good degrees of trust. We need to bring the ideology back into free software. It's, you know, I'd say it's going a little bit out there to say it's not about terminology, it's about ideology. We really need to think about making the world a better place because we can and we should. I have this picture from the original Apple campaign because it really, really strikes me that um, you know this woman coming and taking her hammer and flinging it against the you know the establishment and the machine for our individuality and our freedom, and it really speaks to me now. You know, let's choose free and open source software for ourselves and for our society. So the GNOME Foundation is a charitable organization. We accept donations and um, my talk is freely licensed so feel free to uh, to quote it and uh, republish it. Um, does anybody have any questions? G'day. Um, I guess I, I personally see it as a, a really positive future because I think, the, and I think there's never going to be the year of the Linux desktop where everyone suddenly converts, but it will just be this gradual process mm -hmm. in the same way that most of us have come to Linux after some other proprietary process. So I guess I, I, I'm wondering uh, how you see us engaging with not the entirety of society, because that's way too difficult, but what's the next edge of the people that we can engage with that can then convert their friends and their parents and so forth? I honestly think that the next wave is, is that we need to get into schools as much as possible. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of great initiatives to bring our various uh, free distros into schools. Um, what really strikes me is that in the United States in particular, there are a number of um, nonprofits that are set up as, as technology charities, and what they do is they bring 
um, Microsoft licenses and other proprietary licenses to, um, to underprivileged communities and to schools, and they get tax breaks for doing that. Um, what they're actually doing is creating um, a dependency on proprietary software, and it's a very clever, very, very clever technique because we're training people to use certain kind of software. We need to do the same thing. So I know there are a lot of great initiatives already. GNOME has a number of initiatives that we do this. Um, and I'd say everybody get involved in your community and start bringing, bringing our software into schools. I think that's the first step. I think the next step is writing really cool applications for, um, for our free and open platforms. If we've got the next cool thing, then people will want to use it. There are a lot of different steps. I think you're right, there's no easy, you know, answer to make this the year of the, the, the GNU Linux desktop. It's just not gonna, you know, it just doesn't happen as easily as that, but there are things that we can do in schools is I, I think the first place we should start. Thank you. Uh, two things if I could. One is, in, for us in Australia and other countries, if the FDA has approved it, is that it? Is it accepted here with us, without us having our own standards and rules, seeing the software, any of that? So I haven't actually looked into, I should have, I, I thought, I actually thought this morning that I really needed to check what the situation is in Australia, but I did look in, um, I, I know that in the UK and other countries there are comparable bodies. Mm -hmm. The ones that I've looked in so far also don't review the source code. So they have similar review processes. Um, the FDA only, only applies in the United States. Um, so each region has its own approval process. But, um, but from what I've discovered so far in the regions that I've looked at, they're similar. The other thing is that there are other areas where software is extremely important that you've mentioned during your talk, like avionics and gambling machines and so on. And in some places in the world, there are different rules. There's yep. review of code and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. So two things out of that. One is it seems a shame that there aren't general government standards for software where it matters. Is, have you got any thoughts on how we could make that happen? Well, we have to become real advocates, and um, what's, what has really struck me is that the proprietary software companies have such an amazing lobby. They have so much money that they can pour into making sure that the, the, the government is deeply concerned about their innovative edge on, you know, for their, their products, that, um, that they keep their appropriate incentives. Now, medical devices is a really good example of how that breaks down. Um, when you think about the business case, of, um, of medical devices, you sort of start to see, okay, well, I'm not buying my heart device, I'm not choosing the brand of my heart device because it has the, you know, the best software on it. I'm choosing Medtronic because they have, um, they have a good track record because they are a precision manufacturer of really detailed equipment and they have been for a long time. If they publish their, so their software, even if they publish their hardware specs, um, it's not like, you know, it's not like Nokia is going to go and start producing medical devices. They, you know, and if they did, it would take some time to get doctors comfortable with the fact that they would be relying on them. They've got good support. So, you know, there's this whole this whole issue of of the fact that these proprietary software companies have a really strong lobbying force. Um, the only response I've gotten from Medtronic so far is saying, you know, we we our business case relies on keeping our software proprietary. Um, in the United States, there were a bunch of um, breathalyzer cases for drunk, drunk drivers. And um, those drivers, um, there was a, a driver who said, um, you know, if you're gonna convict me based on the fact that this breathalyzer said my blood alcohol level was very high, I want to be able to see the source code in order to de you know, determine whether or not that was accurate, accurately um, derived. And the, um, the company fought it and said, you know, this is our prior technology, blah, 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 blah. Eventually the court said you must produce the software, um, the source code, and, um, and what the court found through experts was that the results could not be relied on. So, thing, yeah, I mean, ama amazing stuff. And this happened in a lot of different jurisdictions. Some in the United States, some jurisdictions say you must produce the, the code, others say no. Um, but I think at the end of the day, we need to keep this in our, our dialogue, keep asking these questions um, th th throughout our different, our different areas, um, from, from you know, breathalyzers to medical devices, um, and, and being a, a really um, vocal community about these issues is going to help. Um, we, we also need to organize from a lobbying perspective as well because there's just so much funding on the other side. Uh, there was a question back there. Oh, you've got the mic, Jake, okay. Hi. Um, so first of all, I think your talk was totally awesome and thanks for expressing 
basically the, the core of free, the free software ideology, which is that free software is about freedom, including the freedom to know how you're kept alive, which I think is really important. So thanks for doing that. And uh, as far as the remote car exploit stuff, that's actually from Alexi, Carl, and Franzi in the lab at UW where I work. Mm -hmm. And uh, those exploits were done remotely through the, through the telematics units in the cars. So just like hard implants, people can crash your car remotely. So this, I mean, and it's like through a telephone. Yeah, I actually, I, so, I meant so to... that's really important. I, I meant to get that in, into, into a little bit more detail, but yes, the, the control of the cars were, were remote. Um, I also wanted to mention the uh, HP printer exploit uh, that uh, happened recently where, um, where um, remote, over, over the internet, um, folks were able to take control of HP printers, um, which not only were able to do all kinds of terrible things like uh, be able to know what you're printing, including monitoring to see if you're printing tax documents, and if so, determining what information was included in particular boxes, but they were also able to, um, to set printers on fire. Um, <laughs> they weren't? No. They, they were. There was a guy at the CCC that set a paper on fire this year. Yeah. Okay. He lit the paper on fire. But he hacked, as far as I understood, he hacked the temperature control unit in hardware. You should either anyway. talk in the microphone or ask a question. <laughs> so the question I was going to ask you is, you're, you're talking about accessibility. Um, and one of the things I've noticed is that people that are blind are totally fucked when it comes to using computers. And if you want to get a Braille terminal, it can cost somewhere like six or 8,000 euros to get them. And there's one group in the UK that's looking at building affordable ones, I think, coming in somewhere at $1,000. But I wonder what GNOME can do to make it so that computers are really accessible in terms of alternate methods of interfacing with the computers, especially for people that are blind or mm -hmm. unable to see. And I wonder if you can talk a bit about Braille terminals and maybe making them accessible and so on. Yeah, um, this, this, I was gonna say this actually is a, a separate talk. There was a talk on, um, on accessibility at this, this conference, um, but um, I don't wanna get into too much detail about, about the, um, the particular initiatives, but, um, but uh, with GNOME 2, there were a lot of assistive um, technologies for, for vision, a lot of magnification, um, and other, other types of, um, of software that were very helpful, but, um, um, and actually, GNOME won several awards for their, um, the accessibility of their desktop, um, but um, while we rewrote GNOME 3, we actually broke a lot of our um, assistive technologies um, as part of the necessity of starting all over again and starting new. So actually, our campaign is much more basic than that. I'd like for us to get there over time, but we have great, um, some great software, but it needs help just to get working. Um, so the accessibility campaign that we're running now is really fundamental. Um, if we get a, a, a huge um, level of support from it, we can, we can hire developers to work on this stuff and we can start exploring some of those particular initiatives. But it's sort of like now, uh, the accessibility team at GNOME at our, um, at our annual general meeting, I asked them to give a, a little presentation of where we stand, and the first slide was, um, was a set of stairs. Um, so right now we have, we have a lot of work to do. Um, we need to bring our new system back to where we were with, um, with GNOME 2, and then we need to, to go beyond. We're much further now with GNOME 3 than we were when we launched GNOME 2, but, um, and GNOME 2 went really far, but we, we really have a long way to go. So there was a question from someone right over there who had put his hand up straight away. And if we can I'll have be really, one really more fast. question, we'll have to wrap it up after that. Thank you. I am concerned that should your implant fail and you collapse to the floor, I don't know what to do. Is it just CPR or is there something else I should do and how is that That's a great question. That's a great question. Everybody should be trained in CPR. Um, and I, I, I became aware of this and asked all of the people close to me to, train, um, to get trained in CPR when I found out I had this heart condition. Um, so if somebody collapses in front of you, you should commence, well, commence CPR. You should check, um, check their life signs and, and follow that procedure. For me, if, if I collapse now, my device will most likely shock me. Um, and if it doesn't, if somebody performs CPR, hopefully we can get my um, blood circulating until, um, until help comes and, and uh, I, can, I can be shocked with an external defibrillator. Um, the truth is, 
that it often takes so long to get an external fibrillator and to get people's heart started again that there's often some brain damage by the time that happens. So that's part of the reason. Huh? There's one in the lobby, yeah, a lot of, um, and, and, and it's funny because I kind of, when I walk by those now, I think those are for suckers. <laughs> I've got my own. <laughs> I'm really glad that I have this piece of technology, um, and I'm glad that I can rely on it. I just think it can be better and safer. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but a huge round of applause for Karen. Thank you.